Antonio Vestiano Blanche was born on October 28 in Havana, Cuba. In 1960, he was a public accountant, working as an assistant manager at Banco Financiero, the bank owned by Cuban sugar assistant, Cuban sugar magnate and CIA asset Julio Lobo. Vestiano was also president of the Cuban Certified Public Accountants Association. The Vestiana story is ubiquitous among JFK researchers on the Kennedy assassination, but views vary considerably about what events did or did not take place. The lengthy and Byzantine story of Vestiana's activities with U.S. Army intelligence and the CIA is dominated by his claim that he had a meeting with Dave Phillips, who was using the pseudonym Morris Bishop in Dallas, Texas in September 1963. Furthermore, Vessiana claims that a man he later recognized as Lee Harvey Oswald was also present at that meeting. For four decades, that single assertion has sucked the oxygen out of attention to the less sensational but necessary vital research into the rest of Vestiana's story and the documentary record surrounding it, such as it is. I've got, given you a a handout, you might want to be looking at this chart as I go through the next couple of pages. Any more copies? Uh, yes. Yeah, there's more. Thank you. accounts have radically changed over the four decades leading up to the appearance of his 2017 book, Train to Kill. The books written about Vessiana's alleged history with David Phillips have, up to the present day, failed to notice this crucial transformation. In bringing this matter to your attention this afternoon, I will omit references to works by authors who have not personally interviewed Vessiana, with one exception, Fabian Escalante. In my presentation this evening, I will limit my analysis to Vessiana's 1978 House Select Committee deposition and to the books written by three authors who personally interviewed him. These authors include Gate and Fonzi for the Schweiker investigation, the House Select Committee, and Fonzi's numerous interviews with Vessiana leading up to the, his 2013 edition of the book, The Last Investigation, and Dick Russell in preparation for his 1976 article for New Times Magazine, and Tony Summers in preparation for his two thir 2013, they had earlier editions, but even his 2013 edition of Not In Your Lifetime. In addition to what those materials tell us or don't tell us about Vessiana and Phillips, there are three important events that I'll be addressing. These events directly bear upon Vessiana's changing story about the time he spent with Phillips in Cuba. The first event is Vessiana's transition from incarceration to parole for trafficking cocaine, an offense for which he still claims to be innocent. If Vessiana is right about that, he certainly has a reason to harbor an intense dislike for the person or persons who wrongly put him in prison. It was during that transition as a parolee power that Vessiana gave his first accounts to Fonzi and Russell in March 1976 and June 1976, respectively. The second event took place in the wake of the 1992 JFK Assassination Records Act. Hundreds of thousands of government documents, eventually millions of pages, never before seen, were released. They included lots of records on Vessiana and Phillips. Apparently, until my presentation at Lancer and here this afternoon, American scholars have so far not examined Vessiana's various accounts between 1976 and 2017 in the light of, his enormous, of this enormous release of previously classified records on both Phillips and Vessiana. The third event is the death of Gaten Fonzi in August of 2012. Default slide is still on, isn't it? Yeah, it's on. It's on is it? um, yeah, I just yeah. blew through key three events. You want to go to uh, default slide or just stay on it for a little while? Stay on it? Yeah, I, I, my bad. I'm not uh, doing a very good job of directing you over there. <laughs> there are many minor differences among Antonio Vessiana's version of the Phyllis saga. Over, the, over, those thir over those 36 long years. Minor differences along the way may, in some cases, be excused as resulting from confusion or faulty memory, but there, is also significant, there are also significant structural and existential changes to a story. Um, 
the two most important of these are, first, the date that Vesiana was initially approached by Phillips in Cuba. And you can see that, all those dates down the uh, outside column, and the date that that, that that date was given, and the, the interview or the book in which it appeared. And the second, the date that Vesiana admitted he had lied for 38 years about not knowing Bishop's true name. There is no getting around this unwelcome problem. Major structural and ex existential changes to Vesiana's story indicate deception, if not in one place, then inescapably in another place. The principal task facing researchers today is to attempt to decide which accounts are true or partly true and those which are false. If today we are to rescue any legitimate pieces of this puzzle, we must first strip away a large number of pieces that were false. This job is made all the more difficult by the accounts of American and Cuban intelligence officers who experiences bear upon this mission. Most notably, CIA Staff Officer David Phillips and Cuban Intelligence Chief Fabian Escalante. Cuban interest section officers naturally researched the new records as they poured out during the course of 1994. And as far as I can determine, Fabian Escalante was the only author who immediately discovered the problem with Vesiana's initial story and appropriately adjusted the time frame blunder in his 1995 book, The Secret War. You can see the previous year he was interviewed in um, uh, uh, Ferti's, uh, Ferti's book, and he was giving uh, the year uh, uh, mid-1960. So there's an asterisk by 1959 in, in uh, his uh, 95 book, first, first person who did it. Nobody, none of our fellow researchers adjusted their their, that date in their books and their new editions all the way up to today. Um, I haven't spoke, spoken with um, Tony about it, but I did speak with Dick Russell, and after speaking for about three minutes, he said, you're right, i got to change that. It's just that cut and dry. Sorry, John, when was the actual introduction then? Well, I'll get to that in a oh, second. I'm sorry, you haven't, okay. We're, we're starting in mid-1960s, you can see. The, he, that's the claim. In, in all of his early depositions and uh, interviews. Okay, uh, slide four. Slide four. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so that's, which one is that? Yeah. This one? Yeah. No, no, that's the, the previous default. One. No, the previous one. The previous one? Yeah, it should have a number four on it. Okay, is that it? No. Is that it? Oh yes, Train to Kill was right. Go back. Yeah. <laughs> in Vesiana's final two accounts at the, two, at the 2014 AARC conference in Bethesda, Maryland, and in his 2017 book, Train to Kill, he forcefully and unequivocally contended that Maurice Bishop was Dave Phillips. Mm -hmm. For this reason, in my presentation, for the most part, I will be using the name Phillips instead of Bishop. Only in instances where clarity demands it will I use the pseudonym Bishop. In making this astonishing existential reversal in his story that Bishop was Phillips, Vesiana or others working with him realized that another surprising fundamental change had to be made to the manuscript. We'll go to slide five. Next one, yeah. Let me walk you through this chart depicting the changing date of Vesiana's first meeting with Phillips. The first column shows the alleged date of the meeting. The second column shows when the date was published and the third column describes the books or depositions in which the dates of the first two columns were published. As I said earlier, Vesiana gave his initial accounts to Fonzi and Russell in 1976. His third account was in his 25, 26, March 78 depositions of the House Select Committee. The fourth phase of his accounting took place during the numerous lengthy sessions he had with Gate and Fonzi during the 34 years between the House Select Committee's report in 79 and the 23 edition of Fonzie's book, The Last Investigation. Gate and Fonzie passed away on 30 August 2012. Vesiana gave his fifth account two years later in September 2014 at the AARC uh, conference in, in Maryland. At the time, Vesiana was already in an advanced stage in preparation for his book, Train to Kill. In that work, he offered his sixth version of the events that took place between 1959 and 1993.
the majority of the relevant intelligence documents about Phillips and Vessian in the available record were not released until the mid-1990s. As such, they were not available to Vessiana until then. However, there is no indication that Vessiana or his research associates made use of them until the 2014 AARC conference. Fonzi's 2013 edition of the last investigation, published just after his death, shows no awareness that, Phillips, that the Phillips identification completely uh, was, let me see here. Oh, so, okay, let me read that sentence again. Fonzi's 23, uh, 2013 edition, published just after his death, shows no awareness that the Phillips identification completely destroyed, as Escalante had discovered, any notion that the first meeting with Phillips had taken place in mid-1960. Shortly, I'll explain why this is so. Note that in Vessiana's depositions and autobiographical accounts in between 1976 and 2017, there is substantial stability about the date of Phillips' initial approach to Vessiana. It's always in mid-1960. It was only after, after Gate and Fonzie's death in 2012 that the date for Phillips' recruitment of Vessiana began moving backward in time. In 2014, at AARC conference, Vessiana placed the encounter at the end of 1959. And in his 2017 book, he placed it even earlier, in mid-1959. This two-step backward movement occurred two decades after most of the JFK records were released, notwithstanding the releases that have taken place last year and this year, or last year, I guess. That backward movement in time for Phillips' recruitment of Vessiana was a fundamental structural change. It paralleled a crucial existential change in Vessiana's three decades long insistence that he did not know Bishop's real name. That change took place between the publication of the uh, House Select Committee's final report in early 79 and the publication of Fonzie's 2013 uh, edition of Last Investigation. Over and over and over again, Fonzie had asked Vessiana if Bishop was David Phillips. Eventually, and only begrudgingly, did Vessiana at the very end begin to hint to Gaten that Bishop might have been Phillips. Slide 7. At the 2014 AARC symposium, however, Vessiana surprised the many researchers attending the conference by declaring unequivocally that Bishop had been Phillips. Uh, oh, hold on a second. Slide 7. Slide 7. Yeah, so at the 2014 conference, he surprised us all by declaring unequivocally that Bishop had been Phillips and that he had always known this. Vessiana repeated this emphatic claim in his 2017 book, Trained to Kill. A close analysis of the chart I've just showed you reveals an inverse relationship between two conspicuous trends in Vessiana's account about his work for Phillips. As the date for the first encounter with Bishop moved backward in time, Bishop's true identity as Phillips evolved into a certainty. Moreover, due to the mid-1990s release of JFK records, this inverse double trend exposed an extraordinary fact. Without this backward movement in time, Bishop could not have uh, been Phillips. Slide eight, please. Even the most cursory examination of the, of the declassified CI records on Dave Phillips leads to the conclusion that the mid-1960 date for the first encounter in Havana excludes Phillips. It is time for American and British researchers to do some catching up. Phillips was not in Cuba in mid-1960. He was in Washington and up to his eyeballs in setting up the propaganda and psych warfare ops for Eisenhower, Eisenhower's covert program to overthrow Castro. Slide nine. I want to address now the fiction of that six-month Vessiana Phillips collaboration in Cuba during 1960. The impossibility of a mid-1960 date for the first Vessiana Phillips encounter is only the tip of the iceberg. What Vessiana says happened after Phillips' initial recruitment pitch is even less feasible. He says that Phillips was present in Havana to arrange for several tests and evaluations of him. Vessiana claims after completing those tests, Phillips then returned to Havana to, to arrange for a three-week training program for Vessiana that included psychological warfare and sabotage operations. Vessiana claims that Phillips was present for several of these evening training sessions. 
This account is fundamentally flawed. It puts Phillips boots on the ground in Cuba from mid-July 1960 to mid-March 1961, just weeks before the disaster at the Bay of Pigs. Phillips was not in Cuba for one single day during that time frame. Well before that time frame, in February 1960, he had barely escaped from Cuba with his life. Obviously, Phillips' value to Eisenhower's plans to overthrow Castro far outweighed any crazy covert scheme to throw him back into the Cuban frying pan just to recruit and train a single anti-Castro agent. Unlike the CIA officers at the Havana station, Phillips and his family had no diplomatic protection and were, not, and were therefore in much greater danger. Not surprisingly, as his situation became increasingly precarious during the fall of 1959, the CIA decided to pull Phillips out of Cuba. He was on temporary duty at CIA headquarters on two or possibly more occasions in January and February 1960. At that time, both he and his family left Cuba, narrowly escaping Castro's clutches. After February 1960, Phillips would never set foot on the island again. On 14 March 1960, he entered on duty at CIA headquarters. There, working in the HC's Cuban task force, he was in charge of the very demanding propaganda and psychological warfare operations at headquarters and the JM Wave Station, responsible for that too, in Miami, design, uh, designed to overthrow Castro in Cuba. Default slide for a little bit. That's number one, zero, all the way to the top. Just to use the bar to scroll up. Placing Phillips inside Cuba, from mid-July 1960 to mid-March 1961 is obviously way out of touch with the facts about his true location and activities. So much so that it begs the question of why Vesiana and his research associates, if indeed there were any, did not adjust this time frame until 2014. As I mentioned a moment ago, Vesiana created a twofold backward shape shift of the time horizon for his Phillips scenario. 2014, he put the initial approach to the end of 1959 and in 2017, he placed that event in mid-September 1959. Thus, our task today is to forget about Vesiana's long-standing 1960 scenario. But we are reminded that this sort of deception necessarily raises questions about the alleged meeting with Phillips and Oswald in 1963. We don't want to just look at Act 3. We need to know what happened in Act 1 and 2 as well. At least it will give us some context for evaluating what is an extraordinary claim without very much evidence. For the moment, let's forget about the Oswald encounter too. Let's see what happens when we take Vesiana's account of this relationship with Phillips in Cuba and move it, as Vesiana did in his book Train to Kill, into the time frame from mid-September 1959 to March 1960. In my view, a lot is riding on this examination. Slide 10. The plausibility of the mid-September 59 scenario for Phillips' first approach to Vesiana. Is, it, is this it? Uh, slide 10. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. It's just a, a subtitle. If for any reason Phillips had made a trip to Cuba in the second half of 1960, he would have been executed. As it turns out, that problem also spells trouble for Vesiana's current scenario of events. Phillips' mid-September 1959 recruitment of Vesiana. In volumes one and two of my series on the JFK assassination, I dealt with the urgent security problem that resulted from Phillips' involvement with the Cuban cattlemen's conspiracy to kill Castro. In the present volume, volume three, that security problem and another concomitant major security flap that I will introduce to you shortly undermines the plausibility of Vesiana's 1959 scenario. And when you get to that point, you have to begin wondering by what logic any of Vesiana's claims can be trusted. Mm -hmm. Writing his book, Trained to Kill, during the years leading up to its release in 2017, Vesiana had undoubtedly become familiar with Philip's memoir, The Night Watch. He should also have become familiar with a large volume of CIA documents detailing Phillips's locations, movements, and CIA responsibilities in 1959 and 1960. Having decided to come out of the closet in 2014 to admit that he always knew Bishop was Phillips, Vesiana had to face the complicated problem of recasting the entire saga of Phillips' initial approach to assessment of and training for Vesiana into a time period that Phillips was actually in Havana. That time frame was a completely different context in which to fit the 38-year-old tale of his relationship with Phillips. Let's go to 10A. As I mentioned a moment ago, Cuban intelligence chief Fabian Escalante figured this out in 1995. 
But at this point in 2017, when Vessian had finally faced the music, that makeover turned out to be about as easy as placing a square peg into a round hole. Slide 11. We do not know when Vessiana figured out that this mid-1960s scenario was unworkable. I mean, well, he did it by 1995. What we do know is that he did not publicly endorse a nine, uh, that Vessiana did not publicly endorse a 59 scenario until after Fonzie's death when he appeared at the, at the art conference in 2014. In his 2017 book, Vessiana pushed the first encounter even further back in time. He anchored Phillips' recruitment of him in mid-September 1959 by tying it to a firm known event. He said, quote, Dave Phillips came to meet me for the first time just a few days after Jack Ruby departed Cuba, unquote. Cuban immigration records show that Jack Ruby left Cuba on 11 September 1959. It turns out that on 15 September 1959, CIA headquarters was in the midst of not one, but two urgent security investigations about Phillips' increasingly hazardous situation in Havana. Therefore, I will lay out Vessiana's 2017 account using his chronological sequence of his approximately 67 days, 15 September to 21 November, of activity with Phillips in Cuba. And I will examine that against the backdrop of what was happening to Phillips during the same time period. Go to slide 12. Let me take you back in time to the, to the 1959 Cuban Cattlemen's con Conspiracy to kill Castro. Toward the end of July 1959, the CIA station in Havana instructed Dave Phillips to contact Michael Malone, vice president of the Carnival Rionda firm, which controlled four of the, uh, the major sugar companies in Cuba. Malone was also the manager of Robert Kleberg's King Ranch, which included a 5.7 million, 40,000 acre Cuban cattle ranch in Camagüey province. In his 6 August 1959 memo, Phillips wrote down what happened as a result of that directive. On 29 July, Phillips, as instructed, met Malone in his room at the Hotel Nacional in Havana. Malone said he had talked with several people at CIA headquarters about his association with a group of Cuban cattlemen anxious to do something about Castro's agrarian reform program. CIA headquarters had told Malone that Phillips would be able to act as an advisor in a public relations program. The cattlemen had approached Malone in the hope that he and the interest he represented would contribute to a fund being generated to prepare a so-called plan of action. Malone told Phillips that Canis Milanis was the president of the Cuban Cattlemen Association. Phillips was driven to meet Canis at a large home in Miramar. Phillips had been assured that he and Malone would only be meeting with Canis and, another, and one other associate. When Phillips entered the home, however, an attorney for the Cattlemen's Association and several others also joined the meeting. In his detailed account about the meeting afterward, Phillips said that in view of being in this, quote, sudden crowd, unquote, he was inclined to be as discreet as possible. We'll need to bear this state of mind and his reaction to this unwelcome situation shortly. From the beginning, Ken has dominated the two-hour meeting. What Phillips did not know at the time was that Canis Group was one of two nuclei working inside of Cuba with the Dominican Republic dictator Trujillo to overthrow Castro. If the plot succeeded, Canis would become the new vice president of Cuba. When Canis challenged Phillips to offer a public relations plan, Phillips responded with a proposal to buy a newspaper and use it to make daily editorial attacks against the drastic aspects of the agrarian reform program and growing communist activity in Cuba. Phillips recalled that the cattlemen liked the idea and talked about which newspaper to use. But from this point in the meeting, it became clear to Phillips that this particular group of Cubans was less interested in public publicity work than in direct militant action to overthrow the Castro government. They spoke of many other Cubans who were with them and discussed possible paramilitary activities. What would happen if there was an invasion of Cuba from the Dominican Republic, the possible effect, effect of bomb throwing, and what would happen if Castro was assassinated. In his memorandum recapitulating these events afterwards, Phillips recalled that the meeting had become really conspiratorial and that all he wanted to do was get out of this nightmarish scene. He said that this group was undisciplined about security and did not know exactly what they wanted except for Castro's head. Phillips sus suspected correctly that there might have been an informant in the group. He reasoned that with the new death penalty in Cuba for anti-revolutionary activity, at least one member of this group might inform the government. 
And again, we need to pay close attention to Phillips' suspicious reaction to what's taking place. There were more disturbing details that Phillips did not know about Kainis and the Cattlemen's Group. In June 1959, Kainis had criticized the agrarian reform program for being more radical than the program proposed by the Cuban communists in 1956. At the same time, Kainis Group had approved a fund of $500,000 to bribe newspapers to denounce the reform. The danger of meeting with Kainis Group was much greater than even Phillips imagined. July 1959 was the moment of a key event in the communization of Cuba. As Castro later told journalist Herb Matthews, the Cuban communists had men who were truly revolutionary, loyal, honest, and trained. Castro said, I needed them. July 1959 was the moment that Castro decided to lower the boom on the Cuban cattlemen. Let's go to slide 13, please. After Phillips extricated himself from that frightening meeting, uh, we're on slide 13. It doesn't yeah. show the number up there anymore like it used to. Doesn't it should on your screen. It doesn't even on the screen here. Yeah, uh, that's 11, sorry. I must have the wrong direction. 13 was that. Right. Okay. He spent the next several days composing a 15 paragraph memorandum about his upsetting experience with the Cuban cattlemen. Dated 6 August 1959, the memorandum was just five weeks before Antonio Vesiana's book, Train to Kill said that he was first approached by Phillips in Havana. At that moment, as that moment for the recruitment neared, keep in mind the great deal of angst in the Havana station and at CIA headquarters over the dangers that lay ahead for Phillips, his family, and CIA operations in Cuba. In his autobiography, Phillips recalled that he was sorry for accepting such a downright dangerous mission. He said that he said that realization had led to the decision that he had made with his wife to leave Cuba and the CIA behind and consider taking a long-standing job offer in New York. We'll go 13A, the arrest of the cattlemen. The CIA summoned Phillips to headquarters to analyze the security implications arising from his involvement with the cattlemen's conspiracy. He left on 13 August and arrived in Washington on 17 August. The next day, on 18 August, the Havana station sent a priority cable to headquarters with alarming news that the Cuban government had a tape recorder hidden in the home where Phillips had attended the cattlemen's meeting. <clears throat> the cable warned that there was a distinct possibility that the government not, might know about Phillips' participation through direct recording or, later by, or, or by later mention of his name by others. Kainis, Melanis, and the cattlemen Phillips had met with were soon arrested and imprisoned. This dour news startled CIA headquarters. It led immediately to the involvement of the chief of the CIA's Office of Security, Robert Bannerman. Bannerman developed an active interest in, per, in, in the Phillips case, um, for, interest in Phillips' personal security and the security of the agency's operations in Cuba. On 21 August, Phillips attended an urgent meeting at headquarters headed by Henry Heckscher to discuss the security compromise and to decide what Phillips should tell the Cuban authorities if he was arrested. A detailed plan was required for what Phillips would say if he was questioned by Cuban intelligence. The next day, Phillips and several senior officers from the CIA's Western Hemisphere Division and the Cuban desk were joined by officers from the agency's psychological and paramilitary staff for a crucial meeting to hammer out the exact details of the final plan. After further coordination and phone calls at headquarters, the decision was made to send Phillips back to Havana. Any contact with anti-Castro Cubans was out of the question. The risks were clearly far too high. As Phillips recalled in his memoir, The Night Watch, his cover had become gossamer thin. He could no longer explain the presence of a businessman in Havana without a business. On 24 August, headquarters notified the Havana station that Phillips would arrive on 25 August. And the cable also included a number of additional instructions in anticipation of what um, Phillips might encounter. These are a lot of things for the uh, for time. I'm going to just skip them for their security measures and surveillance measures. We'll go to slide 13B. Um, the station reported on 27 August that, that uh, Phillips had arrived and there were no problems to date. But that tentative optimism did not last one single week. With Phillips' supposed initial approach to Vesiana just two weeks away. CIA headquarters launched a second, separate security investigation regarding Phillips' situation in Havana. 
It resulted in two reports indicate it resulted from two reports indicating that Phillips' work for the CIA in Havana had been compromised. On 31 August, CIA headquarters sent another cable to the station in Havana, this one saying that a security review of Phillips was deemed essential in view of the other recent developments. Jack Malone's lawyer had told him in Havana that he suspected Phillips was an American intelligence agency. Malone then repeated this story to a headquarters officer. Moreover, Carlos Todd, a reporter for the Havana Times, told Phillips he knew that he was a CIA agent. Phillips reported this on his recent trip. <clears throat> and headquarters then directed, directed that the Havana station estimate the, proper, the probable extent to which Phillips had been identified as a CIA asset, what this risk represented to CIA operations, and what should be done about this new security threat. During the two weeks after this headquarters directive, Phillips and Henry Hector conducted a thorough review of this second security compromise. They concluded that Phillips' security situation was the major concern at the time. Hector and Phillips pouched a lengthy analysis in a dispatch to headquarters. Their review discovered that other Cuban journalists and also suspected that Phillips was working for the CIA. They recommended that Carlos Todd should be given a security clearance and put to work. They also recommended that the other journalists had to be convinced to stop talking. This review by Hector and Phillips was pouched to CIA headquarters on a very important date, 15 September, 1959. Default slide. Now here we have come to the cornerstone event of this examination of Vessiana's story about Phillips, against the backdrop of Phillips' security nightmare. Mid-September 1959 was the moment when Phillips' security problem had become the main concern of the Havana station and the CIA in Cuba. The day that the essential Hector Phillips security review was dispatched to CIA headquarters was either the exact day or the day before the date that Vessiana now claims that Phillips first approached him. This role for Phillips was a scene in a drama that Phillips, who himself was an actor, could not in his wildest dreams have ever imagined acting. And this was only the first scene in the play. Let's go to slide 14. As I stated a moment ago, Vessiana placed this, his recruitment by Phillips in very close proximity to a, mem a memorable event with an easily verifiable date, the departure of, 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 from Cuba of Ruby, Oswald's killer. Vessiana now says he now views this timing as curious, but probably only coincidental. David Phillips, Vessiana largest, quote, came to meet me for the first time a few days after Jack Ruby departed Cuba. That would have been either 14 or 15 December 1959. For the time being, I will assume it's 15 September. But I still wonder why it took Vessiana's memory so long to remember Ruby's departure date as the trigger event. Nowhere in any of his previous accounts did Vessiana mention Ruby's departure from Cuba. Incredibly, on that date, according to Train to Kill, Phillips walked into the reception area of Julio Lobo's Banco Financiero in Havana. Lobo was the wealthiest sugar mandate in Cuba and a source of information for the CIA on anti-Castro organizations. The CIA arranged for an embassy cutout to Lobo in a futile attempt to mask their relationship with him, but also made, clear, made it clear that if any time he should have something of particular interest to the CIA, he could contact the CIA station chief, James Knoll, who had diplomatic protection and was not in the hot water that David Atlee Phillips was. According to CIA documents, Julio Lobo was one of the best known and closely surveilled figures in all of Cuba. In June 1959, Lobo went to the U.S. to contact officials to secure American approval for his plans to help counter-revolutionary Cuban groups overthrow Castro. Merely to be seen walking in into the lobby of Lobo's bank would have been a risky move for Philippines in, in, for Phillips in September 1959. As I explained a moment ago, this alleged visit by Phillips to Lobo's bank would have taken place at the very moment at, that the Havana Station and CIA headquarters were struggling to ensure that his work for the CIA would not come to the attention of Cuban intelligence. Lobo's bank and counter-revolutionary activities, including, uh, including Antonio Vassiana, had been under tight surveillance for some, quite some time. Only a few weeks later, Che Guevara would summon Vesiana to two meetings in which he attempted unsuccessfully to recruit Vesiana to penetrate and report on Lobo's anti-Castro activities. In any event, Vesiana says that Phillips uh, told the receptionist his name was Maurice Bishop and asked to speak with him. Vesiana, who was working as an assistant bank manager, they said, send him right up. At this point, some more background on Lobo and the Cuban, Cuban industry is worth uh, throwing in here. 
Many sugar businessmen in Cuba had been taking their money out of Cuba as early as 1957 due to concerns over Castro's 26 July movement and increasing attacks on the Batista regime. Lobo and other planters had ignored these, ignored these early warning signs, hoping they could control Castro or that the Americans could. In his work, The Sugar King of Havana, John Rathbone said that uh, this was partly because Lobo believed deeply in Cuba and was critical of anyone who did not, and also partly because Lobo continued to invest in the island, and events moved so quickly that it soon became too late to stop investing. Rathbone's book also reported that at the time, Lobo was a personal source for the director of Central Intelligence, Alan Dulles. Julio Lobo was eventually assigned the CIA cryptonym AM Ember 1. While we are not certain exactly when that crypt was assigned, the information Lobo was passing to Dulles would continue for many years as a CIA foreign intelligence operation centered around Lobo to collect economic information on the Cuban in uh, sugar industry. Among the remaining large companies with sugar holdings in Cuba during the period 1957 to 1959 was the United Fruit Company. That particular company and the information provided by Lobo on the Cuban sugar business were acutely important to Secretary of State John Foster Dulles and his brother, Alan Dulles. The Dulles brothers had been on the United Fruit Company payroll for four, nearly four decades. And during 1958-1959, in a blatant conflict of interest, the Dulles brothers and their Wall Street law firm, Carmel and Sullivan, occupied several seats on the board of directors of United Fruit. By the fall of 1959, Cuban intelligence understood not only that Lobo was close to the CIA, but also that the Sugar King was bankrolling several anti-Castro counter-revolutionary groups in Cuba and Miami. So, in the reception room of Lobo's Banco Fanciero was the last place Dave Phillips would want to be on 15 September 1959. And if being seen in that place seems to be exceedingly poor trade craft, what Vessiana says happened next was even worse. Go to slide 15, please. Vessiana, Phillips recruits Vessiana over lunch and drinks at the famous La Florida restaurant. The impossibility of a mid-1960 date No, I think that's right. Uh, slide 15, please. Sorry. The impossibility of a mid-1960 date for the first Vessiana Phillips encounter is only... No, I'm done with that. <laughs> Vessiana claims that after he asked Phillips what he wanted, the latter invited him to lunch to listen to a proposition. Vessiana said he couldn't oblige this then, but the two agreed to meet for lunch the next day at 1 p.m. at the famous La Floridita uh, restaurant. The iconic bar and restaurant was just a few blocks away from the bank on a short walk along Old Havana's crowded principal path, Obispo Street. According to Train to Kill, Phillips was already there when Vessiana arrived and spotted him at the bar nursing a martini. Phillips asked the bartender to get Vessiana a drink. Vessiana ordered a daiquiri. The two men took their drinks to a table. During the lunch, Phillips asked Vessiana if he was willing to cooperate with, quote, us, unquote, to organize a resistance against Castro's government. Vessiana says he replied, quote, yes, I'll do it, unquote. There is clearly something wacky about this scene. Dave Phillips was in the middle of not one, but two unnerving investigations about his precarious situation in Cuba. I must confess that I find implausible the spectacle, spectacle of Phillips entering from one of Havana's busiest streets, the capital's most famous restaurant bar, frequented by Ernest Hemingway and American diplomats to meet for lunch and drinks with a bank manager of a known CIA asset like Julio Lobo. All he needed to do was put him in a, an Aston Martin with machine guns on the front. <laughs> Dave Phillips had been dismayed to find out there were more than two men at the Annie Castro Cuban, uh, at the Cattleman's meeting, with the Cuban, uh, and they had all been rounded up and were in prison at that very moment the Vessiana claims Phillips was having drinks in the bar. Like the scene in the bank, this scene is uh, uh, smacked of uh, tradecraft as careless and as risky as what we would expect in the scene in a James Bond movie. I feel certain that there was no way in hell um, that Phillips, especially during the security investigations he found himself the subject of, would have allowed himself to be seen in a prominent public place with anyone connected to the resistance against Castro. Period. According to the scenario in Train to Kill, at the end of the lunch at the La Floridita, Phillips said there were certain tests Vessiana would need to undergo before continuing to work with Phillips' plan to organize resistance against Castro. One week later, 
on approximately 22 September, Phillips telephoned Vesiana at Lobo's Bank and then drove him to an apartment building close to the U.S. Embassy. A man using the name Joe Melton was waiting for them in an apartment on the sixth floor. Phillips read the newspaper while Melton administered a polygraph to Vesiana. The event ended uneventfully. Another week passed before Phillips contacted Vesiana again. Around 29 September, Phillips drove Vesiana again, this time to a ranch-style home in Miramar, where a Spanish-speaking American using the name John Smith administered a truth drug to Vesiana, interrogated him about his life habits and activities and his views on other topics. Again, according to Vesiana, this meeting ended uneventfully, and Phillips drove him back to the bank and again said he'd be in touch. Let's go to slide 17, please. The day after the Miramar interrogation of Vesiana on 30 September, concern was percolating in the ongoing CIA security and counterintelligence investigations of Phillips' situation in Havana. Earlier in the year, in April 59, the headquarters Cuban desk had requested a provisional operational approval and also an operational approval to use Phillips in the developmental propaganda activities uh, in, in the television field in Havana. It was to be under supervision of the CIA station and assigned the project cryptonym Amaret X. On 14 May, the CIA Central Cover Division approved the agency's use of Phillips for that purpose. On 30 September 1959, a week after Joe Melton's polygraph of Vesiana, at which Phillips was allegedly present, the Amaret X project ran into strong headwinds in the CIA's Office of Security. The Deputy Director of Security uh, and investigations of support, Fred Hall sent the memo about Phillips' security problems through the Office of Security Chief Robert Bannerman to the Counterintelligence Chief of Operational Approvals, Thomas Carroll, Jr. Hall drew the attention of Carroll to the April 1959 Cuban death request for Cuban's use in Project Amaret X. Hall questioned whether Phillips should be used in the project. Hall also drew attention to the 22 August cable to the Havana, uh, to the Havana station sent in the wake of the urgent uh, headquarters deliberation about Phillips and the Cattleman's conspiracy and about sending Phillips back to Cuba. Hall reminded the counterintelligence uh, operational approvals office that an information copy of the 22 August cable had also been sent to counterintelligence chief James Angleton. Hall added that his office understood that consideration uh, had been given to the possibility of information gained by Cuban intelligence which might impair Phillips future usefulness. Hall's warning led Carroll to send a demand to the Cuban desk for details about Phillips' case. Sent on 12 October, Carroll's memo said he was unable to give further consideration to authorizing an operational approval for Phillips. In addition to the details about the Cattleman's conspiracy, Hall wanted access to Henry Hecksher's major security view of the compromise of Phillips' work for the Havana station. Go back to the default slide again, please. Meanwhile, as these gears were grinding in the agency's security and counterintelligence components, not surprisingly, Phillips' activities with Vesiana and Havana continued as carefree as the recruitment lunch at La, at the La Floridita. According to Vesiana's 1959 scenario, the next day, on 13 October 1959, Phillips picked him up and again casually drove him to, this time, the Hotel Riviera for a meeting. It was supposed to be a two-hour discussion of the results of the test administered by Melton and Smith, but it lasted more than six hours. <clears throat> the two men went over Vesiana's test, question, test questions in minute detail. Phillips had concerns about Vesiana. He was too compassionate. Religion and family blinds, Phillips explained, and he warned that nationalism was a dangerous devotion. Vesiana claims that Phillips cautioned him he would need to learn how to lie, steal, and if it comes to it, kill. I need some water. I've got some here. <clears throat> Slide 18, please. Should be done before half, half past five. On 12 November 1959, the Counterintelligence Operational Approvals Office finally approved the Amaret X operational approval for Phillips. Ironically, however, Phillips' usefulness for the CIA station in Havana was over. Headquarters in the Havana station would, not, would have to find a replacement for Phillips to carry out Project Amaret X. In Volume 2, I discussed the CIA's incredible luck with when Emilio Americo Rodriguez stopped by the CIA 
in the late, at headquarters in late 1959 to offer his services to the agency in any capacity. His surprise visit was probably, it probably took place sometime during the third week of November. I don't have time to give you all this, guys. He speaks like six languages. Uh, 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 and um, his, his dad is Ernesto, Amer Ernesto Nap Napoleon uh, Rodriguez in New Orleans, by the way, also a CI asset. Um, <clears throat> His surprise visit probably took place sometime during the third week of November. Afterward, headquarters reported to the Havana station that one Arnaldo Berenguer had accepted an offer to work in Cuba as a CIA contract agent, provided that he received a minimum gross income of $12,000 a year. On 19 November 1959, a station cable replied that they contemplating using Berenguer as a psychological and paramilitary cutout in the Amaret X pro uh, pro project. The station said that in view of the anticipated departure of Phillips in two or three months, Berenguer would also be used as a cutout to take over Phillips' provincial press operations. A December 1959 personal data sheet on Emilio Rodriguez said that he was interested in working for an American company, either at home or abroad, with a starting base salary of 12000 a year. From these documents alone, although there are many more that support them, we can now surmise that Arnaldo Berenguer was a pseudonym for Emilio Rodriguez. In volume two, I propose that Emilio later blossomed into the principal CIA agent for the stay behind nets after the break in relations between U.S. and Cuba in January 1961. The July uh, 2017 NARA release of JFK records confirmed this prediction, as well as my prediction that Emilio's CIA cryptonym was AM IR1 and that he used among his many pseudonyms the name Eugenio. Let's go to 18A, please. <laughs> John, are you insinuating something? <laughs> that's, that's the name he used. And, 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 the, and the new document even had like this, uh, it was like a, a card, and it had all these nets, and Eugenio was right in the middle of everything. All right. I'm going to have to check on that, right? <laughs> uh, send me ten, uh, a check for $50. No, <laughs> no, I'll send it to you if you want. While the CIA was laying the groundwork for Emilio Rodriguez to replace Dave Phillips' propaganda operations in Cuba, the final chapter in Vesiana's 1959 scenario unfolded. On approximately 30 October, Phillips directed Vesiana to go to the same building where he'd been polygraphed by Joe Melton and come up to Phillips' office, the Cuban Mining Company. Vesiana got the name wrong. It was actually the Moa Bay Mining Company. Vesiana also noticed that a Berlitz language school was on the first floor. He then went up to the sixth floor and rang the bell at the mining company office. Phillips and Melton ushered it into a small vestibule inside and closed the door. Vesiana's three weeks of nightly training sessions on psychological warfare and sabotage operations were administered by Joe Melton, and they ended on approximately 21 November 1959. According to Train to Kill, Phillips attended some of these evenings' training sessions. After the, oh, you looking for the where we should be? We well, should no, I'm trying, to, I'm trying, to, trying to rotate the image. Oh, I see. We we're, had we're slide night. Oh, there it is. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's it. Be, that's the wrong way, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But oh, that's that's got that's got. You, there's Eugenio. See him? <laughs> there. Well, there you there go. We go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Is my picture there? <laughs> yeah. There it is. You see him? Where's yeah. Eugenio? <laughs> the top, up at the top. Oh, there he is. Uh. Yeah, Happy's probably O'Malley. I'll get to O'Malley in a second. I've pretty much figured out uh, who, who, who all the pseudonyms belong to. Um, okay, so um, Melton, okay, uh, according to Train to Kill, Phillips attended some of these evening training sessions. After, is, is that 19 or is that 18? Okay, let's go to 19. Go to the next one. Yeah. Uh, after this training was completed, Vesiana says that his meetings with Phillips became virtually non existent because they began communicating via secret writing. Slide 20. <laughs> According to Vesiana, they communicated only when absolutely necessary and then mostly through messages written in invisible ink, hidden in letters sent to an intermediary's address in the name of Caridad Rodriguez. 
Vesiana says that anyone reading them would have been impressed at how dutiful and loving Caridad and her cousin Aldofina, who lived in the United States, continued to be with each other and how lovely their handwriting was. <laughs> Vesiana says that as he ironed the letters, the heat brought out Philip's hidden messages. Vesiana now insists that secret writing became the only means of communication barely six months after he first met Philip's. That method of communication contradicts what Vesiana had said in all of his previous accounts. He never mentioned secret writing before, not once in all the years of his conversation with Gate and Fonzie, and Philip's handwriting was not lovely. <laughs> in his, 19, in his H HSCA deposition, Vesiana described a very different method by which he and Philip's communicated during the post-Cuba period, 1960 to 1969. Vesiana was asked by the House Select Committee how Bishop was able to get in touch with him. Vesiana explained how their arrangement worked. Phillips always knew how to locate him. Vesiana told Phillips about someone through which he could be located at all times. The committee tried three times, the House Select Committee tried three times to get Vesiana to give the name of this person, but he refused and succeeded in getting them to withdraw the question. In his earlier 16 March 76 interview by Gaten Fonzi for the Schweiker Subcommittee, Vesiana had said that this person was a woman and that the arrangement was that Phillips only contacted him through her. No secret writing going on here. In the 1978 interview with Tony Summers, Vesiana explained that the arrangement with Phillips, explained this arrangement with Phillips in more explicit terms. He said that in line with intelligence tradecraft, Phillips always had initiated their clandestine meetings either by telephoning directly or through a third person who always knew where to reach Vesiana. While secret writing is one of the techniques used in intelligence tradecraft, it only entered Vesiana's vocabulary in 2017. One element in this part of uh, Vesiana's scenario was true. The woman who functioned as a cutoff between Vesiana and someone he called Maurice Bishop. Now I'm going to have to eliminate uh, a little bit here, a couple of pages and a half. In one of his 1978 interviews with Vesiana, Tony Summers succeeded in doing what the church committee and the house select committee had been able to do. Summers got Vesiana to cough at the name and location of the woman and, and used to, uh, that Phillips used to contact him and vice versa. Her name was Dolores Cow in, in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico. She told Summers that all Ves although Vesiana never mentioned any connection with U.S. intelligence, she had, su she had supported his anti-Castro activities. Summers also told Fonzie that Cal believed Vesiana had uh, begun to disagree with Castro's policies, but she didn't know exactly when he became active. She did remember a time when he started taking language courses in the evening. The significance of that statement is that the Berlitz School had been in the same uh, Havana building where, according to Vesiana's 59 scenario, he received the evening training sessions from Joe Melton upstairs. Mrs. Cal did not recall that anyone besides Vesiana was involved with this scheme, but she did recall an incident when Vesiana tried to destabilize Cuban's monetary system. At one point, she said he asked her to hide a half a million dollars for a while. Slide 22, Joe Melton's operational profile and identity. Until now, no researcher has ever been able to identify Vesiana's trainer, uh, who he was, who Melton really was. During his 26 April 1978 uh, HSC deposition, Vesiana was asked if he recalled Mr. Melton's first name. Vesiana replied he thought it was Joe, but in training to kill Vesiana said the name was Dick. As I indicated earlier, many details have changed in the five versions of, of Philip's story uh, proffered uh, by Vesiana over the past 41 years. On 25 August 78, the House Select Committee requested the CIA to grant access to all files and index references pertaining to Joe Melton. In addition, the in addition to the standard search of indices by name, the House Select Committee further directed the CIA to search for persons closely fitting a specific biographical profile, even if those persons had no similar na similarity in name to Melton. That profile included the following five characteristics. A white American male living in Havana during the period 59 to 61, engaged in anti-Castro propaganda, clandestine paramilitary and explosives trainings giving instruction in psychological warfare and infiltration activities. This HSCA request also stated that on various occasions that training had taken place in an office of the Edificio La Rampa building located in, El Ver in the El v uh, Verdado section of Havana. The House Select Committee request noted that the building also housed the offices of the Moa Bay Bining, Mining Company and a Berlitz language school. Records checks on the name Mr. Melton 
aka Joe Melton, were carried out by several high-level CIA components and were completed by 29 August. On 1 September, the Office Legislative Council sent the HSC uh, Chief Counsel Robert Blakey a terse response saying that the agency had no information on Melton. As I will explain shortly, that reply was misleading. The CIA did have records, in fact, lots of records on an operational profile that was nearly an exact match for the profile this House Select Committee had requested to be searched for. Let's go to slide 23. Four months earlier, on 25 April 1978, the House Select Committee had deposed David Phillips. They asked him if he had ever worked in Havana with a name, person named Melton. He replied, quote, that may have been the name of the man at the Burlitt School, but I am not, I can't recall for sure. When asked a second time, this was Philip's response. I am not sure. If Melton was the man who ran the Burlitt School, I did not, unless there was one of those casual things of he was one of the friendly Americans who passed you information, and to that degree I might very well have because we became fairly friendly, but I don't recall that he was and had any that he <laughs> asked him to provide cover or run that group. I don't recall that. <laughs> <laughs> This rather incoherent testimony suggests that the name Melton rang a bell for Phillips, but strangely he placed Melton in the right building, the Edificio La Rampa, but in the wrong office. Drexel Gibson, not Joe Melton, ran the Verlitz School on the ground floor. Slide 24, please. Getting close to the end here. Drexel Gibson was among the hundreds of thousands of Cubans and Americans arrested on 19 April 1961 as Castro's forces were mopping up the exile invasion. Uh, forced at the Bay of Pigs. Also arrested that day was James Joseph O'Malia, an, an American professor teaching English at the University of Villanueva. O'Malia was released three months later and was on board a U.S. State Department plane with 87 other Americans. Slide 24A. Upon disembarking, the reporters waiting for the plane honed in on O'Malia for an interview. His comments about the arrests and the releases in Cuba appeared in newspapers across America. The UPI story included his statement that at least two other Americans were still in Cuba's prisons at the time he was freed. He identified them as Charles McCovey and Drexel Gibson, the former director of the Berlitz School in Havana. It is not out of the question that James O'Malia might have sometime been addressed by a version of his middle name, Joe. O'Malia also told the UPI that he had been arrested on suspicion by the Cuban secret police and that he was glad to be back in the good old USA. And well, he should have been. He had been a paid CIA agent in Havana since 1959. His cryptonym was AM Crackle 1, and his file pseudonym was Gordon, Gordon M. Beniaris. By the spring of 1959, O'Malia was a principal CIA station cutout, along with Emilio Americo Rodriguez, whom I mentioned a few moments ago, directing the proliferating anti Castro groups being groomed for action by the CIA. The only CIA station officer who had been a case officer for these groups, codenamed GBAID, had severed his contact with them for several reasons, for security reasons. After Amelia took over, he had so many responsibilities that his contract was amended to pay him $700 a month beginning in 1 May 1960. Omelio's operational profile included the following characteristics. A white American male living in Havana during 1959 to 1961 engaged in anti-Castro propaganda and psychological warfare activities, engaged in clandestine paramilitary and explosive activities, engaged in infiltration and exfiltration activities with support from the CIA station. That was an, a nearly exact match for the profile of Joe Melton that the HSCA provided to the CIA. The agency, in effect, misled the House Select Committee by leaving the impression they had no records that matched that profile. Slide 26, please. James Joseph Amelia Jr. was born on 20 November 1915 in Midland, Pennsylvania. I love Anne's history. At the time, his father, James, was 17. His mother, Margaret, was 19. He had three sisters, Mary Catherine and Margaret, who passed away before her first birthday. The family moved to Sparrows Point, Maryland in 1920. When James was five, his mother died in 1921. She was just 25 years old. The family moved to Lackawanna, New York in 1930. In 1945, Amelia graduated with Kinesi from Kinesis College, a small private Jesuit school in Buffalo, New York. In March 1942, he enlisted the U.S. Army. He was released in November 1945. After that, he traveled to Lima, Peru, where he received a degree from Universidad de San Marcos and met his wife-to-be, Yolanda de los Santos. At the time the CIA was created in 1947, Amelia made three trips to Miami from Cuba, May, uh, 16 May, 22 August, and 18 December. 
Missing travel records make it impossible to determine the length of his stays in Miami and when he returned to Havana and or Lima. Yolanda was not on any of the passenger manifests for the three trips from Havana to Miami. James and Yolanda eventually moved to Havana in 1952 and were married on 9 May. Omelia became, uh, became the principal at the St. George's School in Havana and later teaching English at the University of Villanueva. We know from his activities as AM Crackle 1 for the Havana station that Omelia became a paid agent for the CIA in Havana no later than 10 November 1959, just days before Emilio Rodriguez volunteered to work for the CIA. However, Amelia's frequent trips to Miami before then, 11 April 55, 26 August 55, 21 December 56, 14 November 57, 24 February 58, 20 May 1959, and 9 August 59, suggest that his operational use for the agency might have begun much earlier. The incomplete nature of Amelia's travel records may be due to the use of other CIA pseudonyms backstopped by false passports, driver's license, and other documentation. This goes 27 now. 27. Slide 27, please. <clears throat> Establishing Omela's CI Krypton and pseudonym. For two weeks uh, in late January 2017, during research on Joe Melton for volume three of my series, The JFK Case, I was fortunate to work with two expert researchers on this problem. They are Jerry Shinley and Bill Simpich. Jerry had astutely identified Omelia's CI file pseudonym, Gordon M. Beniaris, from two 1969 CI documents about Reinhold Gonzalez E. Gonzalez's wife, Mrs. Teresita Gonzalez. Her husband, whose cryptonym was AM Call One, had been the leader of the Catholic-based People's Revolutionary Movement, MRP, in Cuba in, uh, until his October 1961 arrest at the farm of Cesar Odio in Cuba. Omelia had been Gonzalez's case officer. A 13 um, June 69 cable was sent by then Chief of Western Hemisphere Cuban Operations Group, Dave Phillips, uh, to the Miami CIA station inquiring about Mrs. Gonzalez. She was receiving $150 monthly payments while her husband was in prison in Cuba. She had attached a note to her May 69 payment receipt requesting that Mr. James O'Malley telephoned her. Phillips' office wanted to know why she would assume that O'Malley would be contacted through the local CI payments office. On 18 June, the station responded that Mrs. Gonzalez did not assume that she could not contact Gordon M. Beniaris through the CI local payments office. Rather, she really wished to pass along recent information about her. Shinley's discovery put the Beniaris file pseudonym in the bag. And from there, I found it simple to work, uh, work out his uh, cryptonym and crackle one, and I'll spare you the, the details on that. Um, Bill Simpich also played a role in those communications. I remember we went back and forth for about a week that on that until we nailed it. it. Yeah, it was. It's just great stuff when you crack something and they, and they put it out. Okay, uh, slide 28. As I pointed out several times today, in his book Train to Kill, Vesiana describes a six-month period for his relationship with Phillips in Cuba. Um, it ends up in his latest version beginning in mid-September 59 and ending in mid-March 1960. I also explained in detail how this account is fundamentally flawed. There are many clues in the book that indicate that Vesiana, on his own, with assistance from someone else, had access to the class declassified documentary record about Phillips' movements and assignments. Either way, however, the, their use of these records was careless. Phillips went to Washington, New York in early February 1960, and upon learning that the Cuban, Cuban secret, secret police were on to him, he extricated his family from danger in Cuba and never returned to the island again. So what was that date? in February, early February, 1960. Standing alone, such an inaccurate portrayal of Phillips' location during February and March 1960, while problematic, he not be given much time and energy. After all, there are several small inaccuracies and inconsistencies in Vesiana's five account over the years. Yet that portrayal does not stand alone. It stands next to another account about Phillips' final exit from Cuba that is not just a little different, but instead is completely off the wall. And it bears directly on the crucial question about the true identity of Morris Bishop. Let's go to slide 29, please. What Vesiana told Fonzie. The bizarre account to which I am referring is the one Vesiana served up the gate in Fonzie. Fonzie's 2013 edition of the last investigation does not reflect an unequivocal statement by Vesiana the Bishop was Phillips. For this particular graphic on the scene <clears throat> about, uh, about a palpably wrong statement Vesiana made the gate, and I will briefly use the name Bishop for the Bishop character. He told Gaten that Bishop left Cuba before the Bay of Pigs invasion in April 61, uh, that he had not met with Bishop for some months prior to the event, and that after the fiasco, B 
Bishop returned to Cuba. Vesiana told Fonzie that after Bishop's return to Cuba, they had long discussions about what had happened. In particular, Vesiana told uh, Fonzie that Bishop had told him that Kennedy's refusal to provide air support was the crucial factor in the failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion. And finally, Vesiana told Fonzie that this failure led to Bishop's decision to assassinate Castro. At this time, however, the real David Phillips was working in the CIA Mexico City Station as a chief of covert action. The fault slide, please. By the time Train to Kill was published early uh, last year, Desiana now says he knew, no, he knew all along that Bishop was Phillips. Significantly, the book says nothing at all about Phillips' return to Cuba and the long discussions they had together on the island. Obviously, this was one of the more one more the many incorrect stories Vesiana had told Gayton. The allegation to Fonzie that Phillips returned to Cuba after the Bay of Pigs and engaged in long discussions cannot be ascribed to faulty memory or the interpretation of a co-writer. No one in Cuba or the CIA could possibly fail to remember, uh, CIA Cuban operators, could possibly fail to remember where they were inside or outside of Cuba just before or after the Bay of Pigs. <clears throat> Just like Nosenko would have known whether he joined the KB, KGB before or after the death of Stalin. Regrettably, Gate and Fonzie passed away before he was able to solve the ultimate meaning and motivations of Vesiana's deceptions. But Gaten had his suspicions and has left us several clues. So is Vesiana. On the back side of your handout there, there's what I'm going to read you now. Vesiana himself was anxious to use me, says Gaten. When Vesiana was released from prison, I showed up at his door. He immediately decided to use me to build himself a shield against another set up. He decided to reveal just enough to let Bishop and the agency know that if they continued to play dirty games with him, he would uh, now have a weapon with which to fight back, the threat of a congressional and public exposure. At times, Vesiana would admit to me that Bishop might be behind, this drug, uh, be behind his drug charge setup, but then he would revert back to blaming it on Castro. And then there's this. A slide 31, please. At the September uh, 24 art conference in Bethesda, through his interpreter, Fernand uh, Amandi, Antonio Vesiana made the, made the following two intriguing remarks. Vesiana said that it was Philip's performance at the Association of Former Intelligence Officers luncheon that led him to realize that his idol, Phillips, was just an ordinary human being. Vesiana stated that the, real, that the reason that he waited until... His, this 2014 conference to state unequivocally that Bishop was Phillips was because he was almost 86 years old and he had withheld it out of loyalty and appreciation to Phillips. I ask you, isn't it strange that Vesiana's idol, the man to whom he had remained loyal out of appreciation, was the same person Vesiana thought was behind his drug charge setup? That's right. Okay, default slide. Let me summarize now. Perhaps there's a way to square this circle. I don't know. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Perhaps all of Vesiana's deceptions boiled down to protecting his family from harm. After all, he had survived an, an assassination attempt and not, longer, and not long after getting out of jail in the summer of 79. The principal weakness in Vesiana's story at its beginning is his impossible tale about being recruited by Phillips in mid-60 and working with him there till the end of that year. Phillips was working in Washington in Mexico City during the time frame, not with Vesiana in Cuba. By the time Vesiana rescripted his Phillips drama in 2014 and again in 2017, it ended up in an implausible, far-fetched setting, far setting. Some of the recent recasting might not have been entirely his own work. Another author, perhaps others, were also involved. I will remain open to new information about Vesiana's saga as I move forward uh, in time in my present work on the case. In my current volume three, into the storm. Right now, I am vetting documents and details for a chapter on a crucial subject that Vesiana has said very little about, his work for United States Army intelligence and other elements higher, higher up in the Pentagon. I do not anticipate looking into Vesiana's activities in the summer of 63 until volume five. But we're thinking now that the whole thing started in prison, sitting there for four years away from his family and being peeved at being set up. And so by the time he comes out and, and Gaten talks him for the first time, he's figured out a plan to hit back at Phillips. Not because Phillips was anywhere around in the first part of the story, but because there's, there's another act, a later act. Okay, he's in, he's in Bolivia 
and he gets asked to go over into Chile. Is the other or Phillips? Okay. That's how it's and Phillips is in Chile and wants him to come over and help out on an assassination to assassinate Castro, who's on there for who's there for a visit. The assassination is botched. It doesn't happen. And soon after that, um, Phillips shows up to Vesiana and says, it's been nice working with you. Here's $237,000. Goodbye. And he's arrested for the cocaine trafficking. Uh, this was before. I'm sorry. This happened before. This happened before he's in jail. So I had a sequence there. I'm a little bit tired. So uh, what happens is... Uh, about a year, half a year before he's busted for cocaine trafficking, he's in Bolivia. Phillips is in uh, Chile, asks him to come over to help out to assassinate Castro, who's there on a trip. It's botched, and then afterwards, Phillips approaches him with $237,000 and says, goodbye, it's been nice knowing you. And then he's busted for cocaine trafficking, and it's quite incriminating to have $200,000 in cash with you. So I think the whole story that I just read you actually was thought out in that prison cell. And he may have been involved with Phillips, but it certainly wasn't in, in, in 1960 in, in Cuba, and it certainly wasn't in 1959.